Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the meeting of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. I'm Council Member Francisco Moya, uh, the Chairperson of the Subcommittee. And uh, today we are joined by Council Members uh, Reynoso, uh, Levine, uh, Levin, I'm sorry, and uh, I believe, oh right, Casas is on his way. Uh, today we will be holding hearings on a number of applications. Uh, if you are here to testify, please fill out one of the white slips uh, with the Sergeant at Arms and indicate the name and the LU number of the application you wish to testify uh, on that slip. Uh, our first hearing is on LU 312, an, ap an application by Carey's Hospitality LLC, uh, Elder Green for a new revocable consent uh, for an unenclosed sidewalk cafe located at 160 Franklin Street in Brooklyn in Council Member uh, Levin's district. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application and we will be calling um, Simon Robinson and Heather Kirk. Can sit wherever, yeah. And just make sure you push the button to turn on your microphone and uh, if council can swear in the panel. Um, before responding, please state your name. Do you each swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer all council member questions truthfully? Yes. And your name? Heather Kirk. Yes, Simon Robinson. You may begin. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Heather Kirk, and I'm here as a representative of Hellbron and Levy LLP for my clients Paul Longo and Simon Robinson of Elder Green. I want to first thank you for your time to hear us today. We are here before you all in regards to a sidewalk cafe application. The restaurant and bar is located on the corner of Franklin Street and Kent Street in Brooklyn, with the cafe seating on Kent Street. This application, as it currently stands, is to request 11 tables and 22 chairs. Over the course of the past two months, we met with the local community board and were approved and agreed to their stipulations for the operation of the sidewalk cafe. The community board stipulated that the closing hours for the cafe be as follows, 11 p.m. Sunday through Thursday and 12 a.m. Friday and Saturday. During these meetings, my client received both support from residents as well as um, some residents that expressed concerns about noise um, due to the late hours as this is a residential street. Since being scheduled for this meeting today, we have been actively working with both Councilman Levin's office as well as the neighbors on Kent Street to find solutions to any and all concerns that they may have. We have been open to finding, we are open to finding a solution that works for both the residents and also allows this business to continue to be a thriving and positive part of this community. I would like to again thank you for your time and consideration. I will now turn this over to Simon Robinson. Good afternoon everybody. My name is Simon Robinson. I'm the owner and operator of Elder Green. 160 Franklin. Um, I just want to keep it short, as in um, we're a good addition, I believe, to Greenpoint. Uh, we've been there eight months. I've met a lot of good people in the neighborhood, and uh, I believe that this will be a good addition to the neighborhood, having a sidewalk and utilizing our space correctly. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to the council member for a couple of questions. Thank you, Chair. Um, so uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the history of the, um, the site itself or the establishment. Um, the prior to, so you've been open for eight months, prior to your um, uh, taking over that space, there was another um, restaurant that was there. They had a um, uh, uh, sidewalk cafe permit. Um, can you speak to that a little Correct. bit? Correct, yes. Um, they had a sidewalk cafe permit as well that also was located on Kent Street. It was for 16 seats and um, eight tables. 16 seats, eight tables on Kent Street. There was also a part of it was on Franklin Street as well? Correct, but that was only for a short period of time and then it was removed. There was a bike rack installed. Okay. Um, and they had their, their the, um, that was open for the, you know, for their, their um, entire time of business? Correct, um, and evening hours as well. Evening hours as well, okay. And they were a, like a full service restaurant, so? Uh, correct, uh, restaurant and bar. Yeah, restaurant and bar, but they had a 4 a.m. license, but they would have closed around 1 a.m. Okay. And so right now, um, you are proposing to have the Sidewalk Cafe closed at what times again? 11 p.m. Sunday through Thursday and 12 Friday and Saturday. Okay, 11 and 12. Okay. Correct. Um, and you have a liquor license uh, that is... Um, Till 4 a.m. 
till 4 a.m. There's no stipulations that the community board drew up to, to have that be a, a shorter time than that or you know, that you no, couldn't serve alcohol at a certain time. Um, and your sidewalk cafe uh, can only be during the time that your kitchen is open, right? That's correct. Um, and so your kitchen will close at? At, at 12. 12, okay. And then obviously Monday through Wednesday, or Sunday through Wednesday, it will uh, be in at 11. As in we'll end outside service at 11. And um, tables we brought in. So there has been a petition that's gone around and gotten over 100 signatures in, in opposition to the Sidewalk Cafe permit. Um, can you speak to a little bit to what their concerns are and ways in which you're, you're looking to address those concerns? If you were to be able to characterize them. Um, so concerns of the neighbors um, have been a couple of things, just mainly in regards to noise um, at late hours of night. Um, one thing that they've been that they've brought up a couple times is the windows and doors of the space and closing at a certain time. They've asked that we that the business continues to close them at 10 p.m. Mm -hmm. um, every night of the week. And you're um, okay with that? Which was yep. yes. Um, have you had any noise complaints as a, since you've opened in the last eight months? Uh, we had at the in the within the first month we had one uh, one or two from the neighbors above, like obviously growing pains, and then we resolved them as in by handing out our own telephone numbers and speaking directly to us, and then mm -hmm. obviously we removed one or two speakers that weren't um, that obviously were not working in the position that they were in, uh -huh. and then. Um, yeah, and then we've reached out to neighbors. I've reached out to the block association. Mm -hmm. I've done pretty much what I need to do. And obviously, I'll keep going forward, you know, mm -hmm. listening to and any. Have neighbors know. raised concerns about like obstruction of the sidewalk or are they just concerned about noise? No. Just noise. Noise is the main concern for them. Okay. Um, so I don't think we're voting today. I think that we're voting next week. So uh, can I ask that you. Um, work with my office over the next week, talk to the neighbors, see if there's an opportunity to reach a compromise and see if we can and, and work, uh, you know, work together over the next few days to see if we can reach some compromise. Okay. Of course. Is that fair? Yep. Okay. Um, okay. So I, I appreciate, is there anything else that you'd like to share with this committee? No, thank you. Okay. No, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Council Member. Thank you for your First, testimony. You so uh, we've been joined by uh, Council Member Rivera. And now being joined by Council Member Torres. Uh, are there any other members of the public who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application and it will be but laid over. Mr. Oh. Chair, there's a possibility that we will get uh, email testimony from neighbors on this. Okay, matter. great. Thank you. Uh, our next hearing is on LUs 319, 320, the 895 Bedford Avenue rezoning uh, for property in Council Member Levin's district in Brooklyn. Uh, the applicant uh, seeks a zoning map amendment to rezone the north side of uh, Woolby Avenue between uh, Bedford Ave and uh, Spencer Street from an M12 to an R7A. Uh, C24. There is a related zoning text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area uh, utilizing MIH option one or MIH option two. These actions would facilitate the development of a seven story mixed use building with ground floor commercial space and approximately 36 housing units. Uh, I now uh, open the public hearing on this application and I would like to call up uh, Eric Polotnik. And uh, Brian Newman. Good afternoon, Brian Newman. Uh, Is Eric here? No. Uh, Eric just stepped out. He, there oh. he is. <laughs> Brian Newman, Newman Design. Hello, Eric Palatnik. How are you? I apologize Thank you. for that. You were not. It's all right. Uh, if the council can uh, please uh, swear in the panel. 
Before responding, please state your name and make sure that your microphone is on with the red light lit. Do you each swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer all questions truthfully? I do. I do. And your names? Eric Palatnik. Brian Newman. Good afternoon, and I apologize. I didn't realize you were going to go out of order. Okay. Uh, so we're happy to be here today. We're presenting to you an application for a rezoning at Bedford and Willoughby, and it's in Councilman Levin's district. And we are pleased to say that we've been working for the past three years very closely with the community board and with Councilman Levin to request a rezoning from an M12 zoning district to an R7A zoning district with a C24 overlay. I see that uh, staff is passing up all the uh, attachments, so you'll have them in front of you. Uh, when you go through the attachment, what you'll see is we're proposing a seven-story building that will have approximately 38,000 square feet of floor area. It'll have an FAR 4.59, which is pretty comparable to the 4.6 maximum that's allowed within the district. It'll have ground floor retail of about 4,500 square feet. So basically, it'll be a seven-story building with ground floor retail. There is no required parking, so none is being provided. Uh, it will comply with MIH at option two, uh, where we'll have approximately 30% of the dwelling units, which equals 11, thank you very much, which equals 11 of the 36 apartments that are in the building. And as I'm speaking, I'm glad to see I'm not the only one that's, uh, that's uh, running behind my schedule. Thank you for making me look good. Uh, you see on the board, on the TV behind you, is a picture of the building, a uh, rendering of the building. Uh, the design of the building is one of the things that the community board put a lot of effort into. Uh, the developer here is uh, Bill Wolf Petroleum, which is a well-known automotive service station operator in New York City. They primarily operate the Shell stations in New York City. Uh, you might be wondering why we're converting from a gas station and asking for a zoning change, and that's because this station is severely underperforming and through the years is not making a go of it. Uh, so when we went to the community board and we spoke with them, they asked if they could have a lot of input into the design of the building. So Brian, who's sitting next to me, spent a lot of time uh, coming up with the brickwork as well as with the facade materials and the uh, limestone facade materials, all of which uh, were approved by the community board, and which uh, the reason I mentioned Bill Wolf Petroleum as being the owner is because they'll be the developer and they have agreed to build the building in compliance with their requests. Uh, we've also been working with the community board to use locally sourced labor uh, when it's time to construct the building. And we've also been working with a local uh, Bridge Street Development Corporation uh, to comply with the not-for-profit administrator of the affordable housing component should you approve the application. We've met with the borough president's office who also supported the application, I'm proud, proud to say, uh, who also had the same conditions with the minority women-owned businesses as well as trying to source labor locally. So uh, we complied with their request as well. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any further questions you may have. Uh, go through the application in greater detail if you would like or address anything you would like. I'm going to turn it over to Council Member uh, Levin. Thank you, Chair. Um, so thank you very much for the presentation. Um, just wanted to talk a couple of a uh, couple of issues here. Um, first off, um, this is uh, currently a, an active gas station, which um, uh, there are fewer and fewer of uh, in the city. Um, is this? Is this going to, I mean, this is the, there are certainly community members. This is uh, in a community that happens to have a lot of drivers, a lot of cars. Um, is there a plan for, um, you know, do, do, you, do you anticipate where this business would be going? There are other stations around. I don't know the exact addresses for you right now, but we've been asked this question before, and the, we, there are other larger stations around that accommodate the demand. Uh, the owner, as I said before, is, the ga is a gas station operator. That's their sole business. This station is, is not in a high demand capacity. They're not pumping the amount of volume there that you would think would be going on in a normal gas station. The reason why is because it's one of these older, you're familiar with the site, it's an older, smaller, smaller site. It's an antiquated gas station that's there right now. The new gas stations that are developed and the, the, things, the ones that are doing business and are servicing the community are the ones that you see that have the convenience stores in the front. Mm -hmm. uh, they also have large pump islands. I'll bring an application later that has that exact model uh, with a new gas station, not in this district, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's why this site 
is not suitable for an automotive service station use. Uh, the demand simply is not there. There is demand in Brooklyn and there is a demand, uh, but it's not at this location. But there are other locations that I could supplement my testimony today if you would like uh, with a map that shows you the location of other gas stations that are nearby that can accommodate whatever customer base does utilize this. Okay, that would be helpful. I'd be happy to provide that to you. Um, I want to ask about um, the, the development itself or the proposed development. So we're looking at seven stories, 38,427 square feet, 33,000 of which would be residential. Um, with an, with uh, an, I'm sorry, MIH option, which option? Option two. Option so two. 30% at 80%. The 80% AMI at 30, 30 units at 80, 30% at units at, at, at 80% AMI. Um, and do you, uh, what's the unit size breakdown as proposed? This, that question I'm going to defer to my architect who's sitting next to me, Brian Newman, who hopefully is pulling up his unit size information that he's had tabulated, ready to speak to you about. Well, Eric keeps talking. I'll be looking that up. <laughs> I'll get right back to you on that. If Actually, there's another question. I think it's 18, 18 one bedrooms, 18 two bedrooms. Is that right? It's, yes, that is That's correct. correct. As far as the unit distribution goes, yes. The sizes he's going to look up for you right now. Okay, so I could speak to the sizes. Uh, they're ranging from uh, 650, 700, uh, even 750 square feet for a one bedroom uh, unit. So it, depending on where they are uh, in the floor plan, because we actually during the process with the community board, mm -hmm. um, they were very concerned that the rendering we're showing them was going to actually represent what the building was. So we took the time to lay out the apartments, not just the demising walls, but where the bedrooms and living rooms were going to be so we could place the windows in there and then coordinate elevations, floor plans, and then produce uh, this particular rendering. Um, so as I said before, ranging anywhere from 650 to upwards of 770, 780 square feet for a one bedroom, just depending on where it lays out in the floor plan. Um, is there any consideration that's been given to doing additional family size units, so units that are three bedrooms or above as part of this development? I can answer that. There is. Uh, this is, as you know, when we go through this process, the plans that are prepared for you are theoretical in nature. Mm -hmm. you, you're, of course, just simply planning, improving if you should, or acting upon a rezoning application. Uh, the owner, Bill Wolf Petroleum, has been speaking with a marketing company right now mm -hmm. as we progress further, and they are revealing what you are revealing, which is that we may want to put into the mix. The building is not that big. Right. There's, not, there's only 25 market rate units and, of course, 11 affordable units. Uh, so it's, it's looking like now we might be able to add, the last conversation I'm to add maybe two to four three-bedroom units uh, into the mix. Uh, but that's still being talked about, and that's something it came up at the community. There was a lot of uh, back and forth at the community level with that because there's a lot of conversation over whether they wanted to try to achieve it for families or achieve it to young families mm -hmm. uh, that are just starting off. So mm -hmm. that conversation came up there as well. Okay. Um, in terms of um, uh, just a commitment on, on for good jobs on site, is there is there a commitment uh, to, to paying prevailing wage for building service workers? Uh, there, there is a commitment to paying prevailing wages on the development of the project. Uh, as far as building service workers go, uh, we haven't had any formal discussions with anybody about that, uh, but we are committed to using locally sourced labor and to doing the best that we can to try to get all of the supplies and materials that we need to develop the building from local businesses. Um. And uh, this is a mostly commercial block, and I know that this is not the only site that's that's due to be rezoned as part of this rezoning application. Right. So there's several uh, additional sites, uh, four additional properties on the block of um, uh, of Willoughby between Bedford and Spencer, a small four-story commercial building, two legally non-conforming two-story homes, and a newly constructed six-story office community facility building. Yes. And um, I just pulled it up behind you too okay. while you're talking, so that okay. you know others could see what you're talking about on the block. Um, and so. Uh, do you have a sense of what the impact might be on local businesses? There's a coffee shop and a laundromat, I think, nearby. I think really positive, that everything is, is, is going to be very positive for local businesses, uh, primarily for a couple different reasons. The, the buildings that are around us on our block have supported the application. Uh, 
all of them, everybody that, that's near by us on the four buildings you just called out, including the six-story commercial building, mm -hmm. all support the application. Uh, but we're going to be adding residents to the building, of course, that are then going to support the local retail. And as we all know, uh, the local retail is in dire need of customers. And uh, we think that by adding units here, we'll be supporting all the businesses, types of local retail businesses that you mm -hmm. just uh, mentioned. We also did a study of the, of the manufacturing uses in the area uh, during the application process. And this particular block, although located within the manufacturing district, is not improved upon with active manufacturing uses. Uh, so that was another thing that we, uh, we feel justifies the request. Uh, if we were a few blocks over to the right on the imagery up there, uh, Spencer, you, yeah. you start to see things sure. become more heavily manufacturing oriented. Mm -hmm. So we feel we fit the character and we won't disrupt anything. Okay. I hope you agree. Um, okay, so um, I'm, we're not voting today, so if we can continue to have conversations over the next week or so um, as we uh, hear back from community members as well, um, we'd appreciate the opportunity. We'd be happy to bring that to you. Thank you. Thank you for letting us testify. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Very you know, much. I, Thank I just have one quick question. Thank you. So uh, I know that the borough president had some concerns. Uh, how are you going about addressing those concerns? Uh, they were looking for a letter of commitment in writing. Has there been any discussion with the borough president's office since then? You mean about the locally sourced labor? Uh, it was, it's a, a list of, of items that, that they have. Yeah, there was a the locally sourced labor. It was, uh, it was the a number green of, roof, the minority of, women owned businesses. Of, uh, number yep. of units, et cetera, et cetera. We've, we've agreed with every condition within the borough president's request. Uh, we, we've written back to them saying so. So we, we, we seek to comply. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. And um, are there any other members of the public uh, who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application and it will be laid over. Uh, our next, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, let me just uh, acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Members Cohen, uh, Konstantinidis, and uh, Grudencek. Uh, our next uh, hearing is on LUs 317, 318, the East uh, 241st Street rezoning for property in Council Member Cohen's district in the Bronx. The applicant seeks approval for a zoning map amendment to rezone a number of lots on a single block from an M11 to an R7D C24 district and a zoning text amendment to modify Appendix F on and map a mandatory inclusionary uh, housing area utilizing options uh, one and two. Uh, the text would also modify uh, appendix one by uh, adding the rezoning area to the transit zone. These actions will facilitate the development of a new mixed use commercial and residential building. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application and we will be calling Richard LaBelle, uh, Jonathan, Slipowitz, uh, Ron Schulman, and uh, uh, Emmanuel Diamore. Diamore. Okay. Yep. Uh, okay. So now I'm going to ask uh, Council to please uh, swear in the panel. Um, before responding, each state your name and make sure your microphone is on. Do you each swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer all questions truthfully? Richard Lobel, I do. Ivana de Amor, yes, I do. Ron Schulman, yes, I do. Jonathan Seplowitz, yes, I do. Thank you, Chair Moya, esteemed member, members of the council. Good afternoon. My name is Richard Lobel of Sheldon Lobel PC, and I'm uh, happy today to be representing uh, Enclave Equities and Jonathan Seplowitz in the East 241st Street rezoning. I will present the background of the project as well as the actions being requested. Uh, then Emmanuel will discuss some of the architectural aspects, and Ron will address the affordability issues. So the applicant here is Enclave Equities. Enclave is a development firm with uh, a lot of experience in the Bronx and the greater area, uh, if you want to go forward. Uh, we basically included some illustrative um, uh, renderings and pictures of, uh, of applications and buildings that they built in the area. So um, South Fifth Street, as an example, is one where they've uh, worked on affordable housing issues before in Mount Vernon, close to the Bronx. Uh, and we've also uh, uh, 
They've also worked on the Van Cortlandt Library project on uh, buildings in Riverdale, and those are included in the project materials. So the proposal before the council today is the uh, rezoning of East 241st Street and this entire block, and the proposal consists of one major and two uh, minor amendments. The first is the zoning map amendment, which would rezone this parcel as well as the entirety of the block to an R70 C24. So the zoning of the property is currently M11. This would permit manufacturing uses, commercial uses, up to a one for commercial and manufacturing and up to a 2.4 for community facility. The rezoning would permit, obviously, the redevelopment of the, pro of the par parcels with a residential building with mixed use com commercial development. Um, the zoning text amendments that are asked for are the first mandatory inclusionary housing text amendment, which would, have, which would uh, place this block within Appendix F to require affordability on the project as well as other properties on the rezoned block and to include the block within the transit zone which would allow for a decrease in required parking for affordable units. The existing and proposed zoning is in front of you. So as you can see on the map on the left, the uh, parcel in question is currently zoned M11. This is at the center of the rezoning map. And as you can look at the parcel on the right, it is now an R70 C24. So what really does this mean? Uh, it means several things. The first would be that uh, in the East Chester, I'm sorry, the Wakefield East Chester rezoning in 2007, much of this area, specifically around White Plains Road, was rezoned to R6 to allow for, in accordance with that rezoning, increased residential and mixed use density. And so uh, at the time this parcel was included within that area, uh, the parcel was eventually removed for environmental reasons. The city chose not to uh, address some of the more um, uh, tangible environmental concerns on some parcels. So that has since been addressed by the developer, which is why we are now approaching the council with this rezoning today. So despite the fact that much of White Plains Road in this area, specifically roughly 14 blocks or parts of 14 blocks, were rezoned to R6, the development that would accrue from an R6 up zoning did not really uh, occur. And so you had a, uh, uh, this rezoning which allowed for what amounts to you know, fairly dense residential developments along White Plains Road. Unfortunately, though, that really did not come into play. So with the rezoning with which we now approach the council, uh, we've had a really tremendous amount of support given to us by the local area, Community Board 12, which voted 27 to nothing in favor of this rezoning, as well as the Bronx Borough President, which is one of the reasons we're happy to be here with Enclave. So you can see from the next slide that the tax map illustrates the entirety of the rezoning area. This rezoning would take place on the entirety of the block. The parcel itself, uh, the which uh, formerly was um, occupied by several different tax lots, now encompasses a roughly 29,000 square feet in, in lot area. Okay. And again, you can see from the area map that um, there is uh, indeed a lot of uh, residential development within the area. This is going to provide much needed support for that, uh, as well as uh, increased amount of res residential development near a subway uh, terminal, which is kind of one of the um, hallmarks of, of the rezoning activity in the Bronx. Oftentimes, the Bronx Borough President talks about wanting to rezone these parcels near good transportation. The transportation available in this particular area is, uh, is quite rich. You have the two line, which, uh, the terminus of which is right here, as well as many other transportation options. So uh, and now I would hand it over to Emmanuel, who's going to discuss some of the specifics, which is with regard to the resulting building, a nine-story mixed-use development. Good afternoon, Emmanuel de Amor from Afghan Architects. So the proposed rezone will facilitate the development of a nine story. Speak a little bit more into the microphone. Th thank you. Thank Sorry. you. There you go. Uh, a mixed use residential and commercial uh, nine story building. It's approximately um, 25,000 square feet ground floor commercial at 137,000 square feet residential uh, and then on uh, 186 welding units. The, we also have some examples of other rezones in the area that they were very successful. They're built at the moment. On the next slide, we can see the existing, you know, the pictures of the surrounding area, you know, showing the utilization of this lot and the proximity to the train. Um, the next slide also, we have the, the location of the map. And on the bottom right, we see the transit zone that is not mapped within a transit zone because it's an, M an M11 district, but we also seeking uh, for a change on the transit map. 
Um, so as you can see on the plot plan, due to the three street uh, fronting, we have a U-shaped building with an uh, outdoor recreation area on the roof of the first floor. And on the next slide, we could see uh, our you know, effort to please the, the major, majority of the community board that they wanted a, a very, um, you know, a good uh, commercial space on the ground floor. So intentionally, we relocate all the residential entrance and the parking on Furman and purpose so it creates an open concept and attracts uh, many retails in the area. In the next slide, we also see the height of the first floor being 16 feet, and then we reduce to 9.4 the floor-to-floor -floor height, so we have a more context building. And then on the next slide, we have the second floor of the, the proposed second floor of the residential area, which it has uh, indoor recreation space, laundry, uh, outdoor recreation areas, and, uh, and then on the next slide, we could see how we have the distribution of the of the units, uh, you know, on a on a family-oriented uh, environment, we are achieving uh, enterprise green community. So we're providing e Energy Star appliances. Uh, we have the extra insulation for the walls and, and the uh, roof. We also uh, incorporate an active design living principles to in incorporate uh, healthier uh, habits to the building tenants. And uh, as you can see on the in the last slide. Um, it's 189 well-in units, so we have uh, 26 studios, 84 one-bedrooms, 58 two-bedrooms, and 18 three-bedrooms, providing 41% between two- and three-bedroom units. And, uh, and I leave it to Ron, I think, for the financial analysis. Thank you. Hi, uh, Ron Schulman, Best Development Group. We're the advisors to Enclave Equities at 241st. So this project will be financed under the Mix and Match program which basically means 50% of the units will be for tax credit or 60% uh, of AMI or below, including a, a set aside for homeless or formerly homeless people. And then the rents will go all the way up to at least 90 or 100% of AMI. So in plain English, that would mean rents would be anywhere between a low of 511 to a high of over $2,300 and stepped up everywhere in between. So we actually think this is a great mix for the neighborhood where people could um, afford apartments based on household size and income, and it would attract um, people not only from Wakefield but nearby communities of Wakefield. The project would be financed by HPD and HDC, and it would have a regulatory agreement, uh, including MIH agreement. Um, two options would be either 25% at 60 or 30% at 80. And, um, I don't know if any, everybody mentioned, but it's right next to the train, so this is a great place for people to live. You know, the 241st Street Station is the number two. There's buses. It's, it's a good commuter location for renters uh, in this project. Um, any questions you have, we'll be happy to answer. Thank you. And I think I'd just like to conclude briefly to say that the affordability numbers, as well as the entirety of the project, uh, remain consistent throughout the application. The community board uh, is familiar with and, and, and uh, incorporate this into their approval. Uh, I would say that after the Bronx Borough President's hearing, we did um, uh, slightly increase the size of the, of the three bedroom units yes. uh, at the request of the Borough President to accommodate their request. So uh, again, we're happy to answer any questions. Great, can you just go back to what was that percentage for the uh, formerly homeless households? Right, so the request was to increase to 15% of the units in the building to be for formerly homeless people, okay. which will be permanent housing. This is not transitional housing. People move in, they have a lease, they stay, okay. based on um, a very low rent requirement. Got it. And uh, is there a commitment for good jobs on this project? Uh, so I know that, um, Jonathan, I don't know if you want to speak to it, but there's been discussions with, uh, with 32BJ. Uh, we've, re uh, we've basically come to an agreement with, uh, with the union. And um, you know, in general, uh, one of the things that I think was most interesting to the community board is that the retail here is something which is really sorely sought in this area and that they're looking forward to um, you know, local businesses being able to, to locate here, to, to local uh, individuals being able to really uh, thoroughly utilize the retail. So. Um, we're looking forward to uh, our relationship with them as well as um, to you know, good jobs in the future. Great. Thank you. And with that, I turn it over to Councilmember Cohen.
thank you, Chair. Uh, I really I just thought it was important that uh, I was here today because, uh, and I, I don't think I'm going to be able to hide it, how pleased I am about this project. Um, I mean, they spoke specifically about, about the project, um, but White Plains Road is sort of the spine of, of, of my portion of the, of the Wakefield uh, community. And while the homeowner community there is very strong and stable, um, uh, White Plains Road could use a little love. Uh, and I am very, very pleased that someone uh, has got faith in, in this community, is willing to invest significant money. Um, this project, uh, this, th this is the very end of the subway line at White Plains Road. This lot um, has been uh, not used at all it's in, in my memory. Um, uh, as they mentioned that there were environmental issues there that have been cleaned up. Um, so uh, it really, I hope, will be the start of a, of a transformation on, on White Plains Road. And, and it, it does seem to be the case that I think as time goes on, uh, other developers have shown interest in, uh, in converting what really is, what, what has the potential to be, a, as they pointed out, a great place to live. Um, I think it has real uh, commercial uh, potential, uh, sort of continuing the White Plains corridor. Uh, so I'm, I'm very excited about the impact of this project on the community. And I, I will give the developer a kudos. They have been very responsive to the community board. Uh, they went to the community board multiple times, briefed them on the project you know, long before ULERP. Um, the, they were responsive to the borough president's uh, concerns. Uh, they, they worked closely with labor. Uh, so I, I really feel that uh, this is uh, going to be a real boost in the arm uh, for, uh, for the Wakefield community. Uh, and I'm, uh, I know we're not voting today, but ultimately I will be excited to encourage my colleagues to vote uh, for this project. So thank you. Great, thank you, uh, Councilmember Cohen. And uh, thank all of you for your testimony here today. Uh, next, we want to call up uh, Panos Kutris. Did I say it right? Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Moya and members of the subcommittee. My name is Panos Kutris. I'm a doorman at 995 Fifth Avenue and, I've been, and I have been a member of 32BJ for two years. As you know, 32BJ represents more than 80,000 property service workers in New York City. We clean and maintain buildings like the one proposed. We believe that developers should commit to providing good building service jobs in order to build a more equitable econ economy in New York City. The developers, affiliates of Enclave Equities, seeking this rezoning, have made this commitment and we are pleased to testify in support of this project. The developer has stated that a goal of their proposal for the 241st Street rezoning is to help New York City's neighborhoods thrive and be well served. We know this can be done through their promise to build 186 uh, permanently affordable units and their commitment to providing good jobs uh, that pay area standards. We strongly support efforts to build affordable housing, especially uh, when there are good jobs attached. We know that affordable housing and good jobs work together to uplift working families. We believe this project will bring many benefits to the community and will help working New Yorkers live with security and dignity. For these reasons, we respectfully urge you to approve this project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Um, are there any other members of the public who wish to testify uh, on this item, seeing none, uh, I now close the public hearing on this application uh, and it will be laid over. Next, uh, our next hearing is on LU's 322, uh, the 5153 White Street Special Permit application uh, for property in Council Member Chin's district in Manhattan. Uh, the applicant is seeking a special permit pursuant to section 74 uh, dash 711 of the zoning resolution to modify height and setback regulations, uh, inner court regulations, and minimum distance between windows and a lot line regulations. Approval of this special permit would facilitate the enlargement of an existing five story building within the Tribeca 
uh, East Historic District. As part of the special permit, the applicant will provide uh, restorative, restorative work uh, to the facade and enter in into a continuing maintenance program for the building. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application uh, and would like to call up Jason uh, Friedman. And if the uh, council can please run. Before responding, please make sure the red light on your mic is on and state your name. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? I do. Uh, Jason Friedman, yes. Um, 51 White Street LLC is seeking a certi certification for a special permit at 5153 White Street to enlarge two stories on the roof and a new floor between the existing first and second floors at the rear of the building. The site is located in a C62A zoning district, one half block east of Broadway and less than 100 feet away from the corner of Franklin Place. The surrounding area is characterized by mixed use buildings with a majority of building heights of five to seven stories and the area is well served by public transportation. Um, as you can see on these photographs, the building has been vacant since 2016. Previously, it was occupied by Max Delivery, a retail store on the first floor, cellar and subcellar, and residential apartments, market rate, two through five floors. The building had a total of 12 of these apartments for rent prior to beginning construction. Um, the building was constructed in 1858, and the fire escape and storefront you see in the 1990s landmark commission designation photographs on this slide are not original to the building, and they are being removed. The site lo is located in the Tribeca East Historic District, and the Civic Center Synagogue to the right, which borders the site to the west, is a two-story non-contributing building um, with an irregular street wall. The individual landmark uh, building to the east, 55 White Street, is a seven-story primarily residential building that was converted from wholesale fabric building to a mixed-use building, similar to a majority of the remaining 19th century buildings in the surrounding area. Uh, we propose a two-story vertical enlargement that you can see in this axon view. The new floor's design uses a series of setbacks in bulk from 12 to 38 feet, pushing the bulk back from the street and from the west to preserve the integrity of the historical views of the existing White Street five-story building. In addition, the two, the two additional floors, there is a new proposed uh, floor between the existing first and second floors in the rear of the building. In addition to the bulk being proposed, the applicant will un be undertaking major restorative work, including the removal of the fire escape, replacement of all windows front and rear with wood windows, complete white street facade marble restoration, and uncovering of the com and complete restoration of the cast iron with the new ward wood storefront infill and the rehabilitation of all remaining rear yard fire shutters. <clears throat> so this shows the, um, the waiver for height that we're um, requesting. In order to achieve the proposed bulk, the <coughs> we are requesting waivers for height, setback distance, inner court, and rear yard requirements. Shown here are some of the heights of the proposed building and uh, the envelope of the enlargement. Uh, and then here you can see in plan view the uh, portion of the final floor that is non-compliant as of right, which is this uh, small three foot by uh, 18 foot wide portion of the seventh floor. In the rear, uh, we're seeking waivers for inner court. And um, in fact, uh, this building is in keeping with a lot of the Article 7B um, conversions in, in the Tribeca District where you have um, you know, less light and air at the rear of buildings because they were built with um, five, 10, or 15 feet um, rear yards. We're proposing for the new floors at the top, a 20 foot rear yard. Um, what would be normally required would be uh, the court that you see of 1,200 square feet. Um, also, uh, similarly, uh, the minimum requirement for uh, new floors would be a 30-foot distance from uh, windows to the lot line. Uh, we are proposing a 20-foot distance on the upper floors. And here you can see that in section. Uh, the final slide shows the building in context way back when we uh, were mocking up the proposed floors for their visibility. Um, and we did work with landmarks uh, to get a unanimous approval by the commission uh, for a non-visible uh, addition uh, in the heights that were described in the sections. 
Uh, we did get uh, feedback over the uh, course of the process, starting with um, the community board. Once we went to the landmarks uh, com com community board level, we had unanimous approval of the design. Also at the at the um, at the LPC hearing, and when we uh, moved on to the Euler portion of it, uh, we heard some feedback from the community board that we. Uh, it would have been better if we had made a little bit more outreach, even though prior to um, meeting them, we had uh, very lovely support from the synagogue uh, continuously, and uh, we did obviously have our public hearings. But uh, after that, we uh, decided to send some, some more communication to our neighbors. Uh, we posted building notices of uh, the public hearings that were upcoming, and um, we are ready to be great neighbors and just want to uh, work with uh, any neighbors that have a stake in this to uh, complete the project safely and uh, in harmony with the rest of the buildings on the block. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of questions. Um, sticking to the topic of uh, outreach, um, did you submit uh, evidence of outreach to the CPC uh, as requested by the borough president's office? Yes, so originally we had already uh, reached out to the synagogue, and then after hearing from the community board that uh, they would like to have seen more outreach, we posted flyers around uh, the blocks in the surrounding area, um, and we uh, reached out to the neighbors in a letter. And we've had some correspondence with our neighbors uh, who we'd love to just work with on anything. Um, and we also, uh, I think I just want to make sure. So the synagogue. No, I, I mean, I, yeah, I know you said that before. I'm saying, did you submit that if evidence? Yeah. Yes, we did. Okay. Yes. Right. Um, yes. Okay. Uh, where will the AC units on the roof? Um, be located, um, and will, be, will they be visible uh, from the street? Okay, so nothing, uh, in fact, will be visible from the street, from any point of public way uh, on top of the building, especially over the um, primary facade. Even over the west, westerly facade, um, we, we will not be seeing any of the penthouse, including the mechanical equipment. And, um, you know, as we get up to that point, if uh, any mechanical equipment required adjustment, to keep it both uh, satisfactory to our neighbors uh, at 55 White Street, where you could see our building will creep up. That's the building closer uh, to, to us on the screen. Um, and if, as long as they won't be visible from the street, we would be happy to adjust um, our units. And we have no plans for any generators or large water towers, just your standard split system HVAC units that you kind of see scattered around those roofs. And being that uh, this is a significant uh, renovation uh, to a very old building, there are concerns uh, about contaminants in, uh, in the air, particularly, that comes from uh, the removal of paint um, that may have asbestos. Uh, how do you plan to address this concern uh, and mitigate this impact during construction? So um, we have received certificates that the building is free of asbestos. And um, as part of the Department of Buildings process, our permits will reflect that. Um, we currently have scaffolding in front of the building with um, uh, tarp around it. And uh, we've actually uh, nearly completed the process of installing all the new windows. So the building is slowly getting uh, airtight. And we're doing that under a, as of right, a, a renovation of the, of the five-story building at Department of Buildings and Landmarks. And um, as we get, hopefully get this approval and go, go through the existing roof of the building, we will take every single precaution for keeping debris on our site and air safe um, and follow all rules, uh, in Department of Buildings rules, DEP rules, whatever needs to be. Uh, followed uh, in terms of keeping our neighbors safe and our site safe. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony today. And uh, are there any other members of, oh, I'm sorry. No, you, you're, you're good, thank you, my fault. Uh, we have David uh, Gray, uh, Shannon Kay, and Shelley 
Uh, Jervin? Please just state your name and uh, just push the button to make sure that the microphone is on. Shannon Kay. David Gray. And Sally Gervin. You may begin. Uh, my name is Sally Gervin. I'm a resident of 55 White Street and have owned an apartment there since 2002. We're the building with the roof garden on the top uh, adjacent to the building that's being uh, discussed today for permit. Um, um, I must say we've probably had mixed issues in dealing with our uh, with our colleague, our neighbors uh, who are um, reconstructing that building. Um, some has been very positive, some has not been as positive. Um, but what we're concerned about at this point um, in our in what we've just recently learned is about the two-story addition on the top of the building. Um, we didn't know about it before. The residents, none of the residents that I've spoken to knew about this before. We haven't seen any signs posted other than the permits that are posted on the outside of the construction site. If there was communication to the building, to anybody in the building or building management about community meetings or public meetings, we didn't hear about it. So I don't know where that fell through. Um, we're concerned about um, additional height going on to the building next to us um, for a couple of reasons. One is the visuals. Um, one, and probably more importantly is a concern about the noise from the 11 HVAC units that will be posted adjacent to our building. Um, I don't know where else to suggest. Perhaps they can go on the other side right, where there's a closed um, synagogue um, below and not residences. We have 10 children in our building and we live in a lovely yet very urban street that has very few trees. So access to air and sunlight and our, our garden on the roof is, is important for those kids and for the adults that live in the building. Um, it's a quality of life issue. Um, to be able to be up there and have no more noise than we already experience on the roof in, the, in an urban area of New York City is important. And we've, we're worried, and we don't know for sure, but we're worried about the, the potential for these, the mechanicals and the HVAC units to be um, polluting both noise-wise and I don't know about other, other potential pollutants. We have had a, um, an, we have had, as was discussed earlier, an issue with um, outreach with our, with the um, construction team next door. Um, and the most important issue that came up was, I believe it was early 2018, perhaps late 2017, when lead paint was sandblasted off of the, off of some parts of the building 55, uh, 51 uh, to 53 White Street with no, um, with no coverings around the buildings, no precautions taken to my knowledge, no permits um, in place. And our building, our entire building, all the apartments in 55 White Street experienced dust that came in from that. And that dust included lead, we had it tested. And we had a couple of kids who were taken to the doctor with their lead, lead levels um, uh, tested a, at that right. time. It's a two minute time limit, but you can, if you can okay. wrap it up. Yeah. So they had high lead levels. So that uh, affected our trust in, in, what's, in knowing what's happening and that is being done correctly. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, Shannon Kay. David and I live in Penthouse A at 55 White Street. Um, to his point, yes, there is uh, scaffolding and construction on the outside. There is work permits on the outside, but to my knowledge, in the 17 apartments that are in the building, only one individual has been notified and has had outreach communication with the construction team next door. And to my personal 
opinion living in the building, they of course had um, a great relationship with the synagogue next door because the synagogue doesn't live there. They, they don't sleep there, they don't eat there. They're, they're, they're there for a limited amount of time, several hours a week, and this is gonna affect us much more than it is the synagogue. Our terrace, uh, which was built 22 years ago, uh, is approximately 12 to 13 feet recess from the street. If you are on the northeast corner of Church and White, if you are on the northwest corner of Church and White, and if you are on the northeast corner of Broadway and Church and the northwest corner of Broadway and White, you will see the trees on our terrace. So if that terrace that they plan to build at 51 to 53 White Street is a foot further in front of ours, you will see some of their construction. So I would seriously take into consideration what that plan is going to be, because anything further than what we have will be a problem. And in addition to what she said, um, there is plenty of room where the synagogue is to put the HVAC units on that side. So to have them matched up to the 11 to 12 HVAC units that we have will create noise, dust, and additional material that could possibly go onto our rooftop with the children there that should also be taken into consideration. Hi, uh, uh, this is David Gray. Uh, I don't have a, a lot to add. I think they covered uh, everything. Uh, the one thing I'll, I'll, I'll note, um, I, I recently uh, attended um, the uh, uh, landmark uh, committee meeting and um, I, I was very surprised to hear about this two-story addition because um, at that meeting there was a, a development at 131, uh, 135 Duane that was uh, that was turned down um, because of the height uh, issues. So I was just surprised to see uh, that you know this was able to get approved. Um, and uh, you know we just have we have issues and the concerns about the the height that they're trying to put on this build this building. Great. Thank you very much for your testimony today. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, are there any other members of the public who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application, and it will be laid over. Um, our next, so we're here. Yep. Yep. Uh, our next public hearing is on LU 323, uh, the 59 Greenwich Avenue special permit application uh, in, uh, for property in Speaker uh, Johnson's district in Manhattan. The applicant is seeking a special permit pursuant to uh, section 74-711 of the zoning resolution uh, to modify use regulations in order to provide use group six uses on the second floor for the existing building and to modify the bulk regulations to reduce the minimum distance between legally required windows and lot lines to reflect the as-built condition. Uh, approval of this special permit would facilitate the reconstruction and enlargement of this building, uh, which is within the Greenwich Village Historic District. As part of the special permit, the applicant will renovate and restore the building in line with its original appearance and enter into a continuing maintenance program for the building. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application, and we will be calling up uh, Tim Campbell, uh, Judith uh, Galant, yeah, and Brenda uh, Levin. Uh, Council, if you can please uh, swear in the panel. Before responding, please state your names into the microphone, making sure the red light is on. Do you each swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer all questions truthfully? I do, Judy Gallant. I do, Brenda Levin. I do, Tim Campbell.
retail, oh, thank you, a retail boutique uh, on the ground floor for his products, and he has applied for the special permit that is the subject of this special uh, permit application to allow a three-chair small hair salon on the second floor. There would be two residential units on the third and fourth floor, one each on the third and fourth floor, that he would use with his staff when he is in the city. Um, it would be the old-fashioned living above the salon. The second story salon requires a use modification because in the C26 zoning district, in a building that is occupied by residential uses, there can be only one story of commercial use. The project also requires a bulk modification to allow six residential windows in the rear wall of the building to remain in the position they have been in for the last 172 years. Community Board 2 voted unanimously in favor Oh, you're telling me to keep going, not to stop, okay. <laughs> Community Board 2 voted unanimously in favor of the special permit on condition that there be no eating and drinking establishments on the second floor. Our client had no objection to that and in fact offered it when the subject came up. Uh, Manhattan Borough President echoed the Community Board's recommendation uh, unanimously uh, in favor of it on condition that there be no eating and drinking on the second floor. The City Planning Commission unanimously approved the special permit, but with no conditions on the use of the second floor, and I understand that that's why we're here today. Um, I would just like to note that if the 74711 special permit is granted, um, the building would be restored to the highest in preservation standards, um, and Mr. Dean would be required to e execute and record a declaration, a maintenance declaration that would require that he keep the building in sound first class condition for the life of the building. Um, in addition, the special permit would bring Mr. Dean's um, salon and products to New York City and restore the vibrancy on this block, which has been somewhat diminished by the MTA uh, ventilation plant. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Just, just one, uh, and it's just to confirm again. It, just can you tell us, um, one more time, what the commercial use is going to be for the second floor in the building? The second floor would be a salon, a hair salon, uh, where Mr. Dean would cut hair and, and other hair services. Great. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Thank you. Um, Federica Siegel, am I saying it right? Mm -hmm. You can just uh, uh, push the button, state your name, and you can begin. Frederica Siegel. My name is Frederica Siegel, and I represent uh, Community Board 2. I'm the co-chair of our Land Use Committee. On October 10th, the applicants for 59 Greenwich Avenue came before us for a special permit to allow use group six on the second floor of an existing mixed-use building. As they said, as part of their presentation, the applicants volunteered to exclude eating and drinking uses from the second floor of the premises in perpetuity. Their attorney introduced as a precedent for this restriction an application at 19 East 72nd Street that city planning approved in 2017 for another 74711 use modification. In this case, the applicant's attorneys explained to us, the restriction against eating and drinking on the second floor was stated in the CPC report and was also incorporated into the restrictive declaration. With this offer and precedent in hand, CBT voted 42 to nothing at its October full board meeting to recommend approval of this application, provided that an exclusion for eating and drinking be handled in the same way. Recently, the applicants offered to write a letter confirming that there will be no eating and drinking on the second floor, but as you well know, such a letter is not even binding on the current applicant, let alone on future owners. The applicant offered no eating and drinking on the second floor, the community board accepted the offer, and the borough president has endorsed that position. Based on the unanimity of these three parties, and the proximity to, of the windows to the lot line and the precedent at 19 East 72nd Street, we ask you to allow the stipulation to be written into the restrictive declaration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Um, are there any other members of the public who wish to testify? 
Uh, seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application uh, and it will be laid over. Uh, we will now go to our last, our last hearing, which is on LU 321, the 100 uh, and 103rd North Conduit Avenue rezoning for property in Council Member uh, Ulrich's district in Queens, the proposed rezoning to establish a C22 district within uh, an existing uh, R3X uh, district would facilitate the development of a new uh, use new of a new use group 16 automotive service station subject to future uh, BSA approval on the southern portion of the development site. The site would also include a one-story, uh, 3,990 square foot convenience store uh, that will include 13 uh, accessory parking uh, spaces and room for at least five uh, uh, reservoir spaces. I now open the public hearing on this application and we uh, call up Eric uh, Palatnik and Andrew Vill Villari. 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 Okay. Sorry, I apologize, I said that wrong. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and if council can please swear in the panel. Do you each swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? Please state your name before responding. Eric Palatnik, I do. Andrew Valeri, I do. Good afternoon again, Eric Palatnik, and this time on time. Uh, thank you for hearing the application today. We're, we're happy to be bringing you an application where we spoke a few minutes ago about a the gas stations in New York City and we're, we're bringing a new gas station on a site that is a, a good site. It's a 35,000 square foot site, which is what I was alluding to before, which is what modern day gas stations are all about. Uh, we've all driven up and down all the different roadways all around the state and uh, in the city you see some of them and outside the city especially. Uh, the trend in gas stations these days is with an automotive, uh, with a, a convenience store in the front uh, as opposed to service bays and uh, that's what exactly what this site is. Uh, we're located here in Councilman Ulrich's district in Ozone Park, as you know, on North Conduit, which is really better known as the service road to the Belt Parkway. Uh, we are right next to Aqueduct and the casino, uh, and we're immediately adjacent to the A train. We are located within an R3X zoning district, and we're asking you permission to add a C22 overlay to the R3X zoning district. By approving the C22 overlay, you will allow for the development of the automotive service station, which is still not as of right, but requires a companion application under a special permit pursuant to section 73211 of the zoning resolution for an automotive service station. So this will facilitate that application. Uh, it's, it's interesting to note that this site has had a gas station on it since the 1950s, and if you drove past the site today, you can't see it in the aerial, you'll see the, really the ruins of that 1950s gas station still there. So the site has an automotive service station history. Uh, the Councilman, Councilman Ulrich has uh, been actively involved in this application since the beginning, along with Community Board 10. We've been meeting with them and Land Use Committee since we first started the, uh, came up with the idea, and we've been working very closely with them. Uh, that's how we resulted, I believe, in an unanimous approval from, community, from the Community Board uh, and resounding support from the Councilman. Uh, so this application will take this site, as I mentioned a moment ago, which is a former automotive service station, and bring it back to current glory. Uh, I'm flipping through right now on the, the TV screen just to get to a site plan for it so we could show you what it will look like. And uh, you should have the site plan in your package there. Uh, but you could see the, the location there of the pumps in front of the station uh, as well as a curb cut on the far right and a curb cut to the left. Uh, the, the subway station is to the right of the site. Uh, as a part of discussions with the community board, it was agreed to that the site could be made available to people who are picking people up at the subway station. The, right now, people are waiting in cars on the Belt Parkway service road. The Belt Parkway service road right there is heavily congested, very, very heavily trafficked, especially during the rush hour, and people waiting for people at the subway station uh, to get off the A train in cars was causing a backup on the roadway. So one of the ideas that we came up with the community board is to use this site to allow for people to also park on our site while they're waiting uh, pickup. Another issue that came up at the community board level, which you should be aware of, of course you're more familiar than anybody in the city with it, is the proliferation of hotels. And, uh, and that not everybody would like to see a hotel within their community, although some people would. But in this particular community, they don't 
are not in fan, they're not fans of hotels. The C2 would allow for a hotel to be developed. So we have voluntarily agreed to enter into a restrictive declaration with Community Board 10 as an interested party, God bless you, with them named as an interested party, and Community Board 10, uh, it, the restrictive declaration prevents us from building a hotel. So we have agreed to do that with Community Board 10. They have signed off on it as well, uh, and that was really the, the only concern that they had, other than making sure the site is beautifully landscaped and well-designed. To that end, you should know that we're coming before you with one of the greatest gas station operators in New York City. Uh, I say that because you'll take note of them now that I mention them. The name is BOLA, B-O-L-L-A. They are the ones that are going to be operating this site. Uh, their stations are the ones that are nice when you drive around New York City. Uh, they are well landscaped. They have grass to the extent that they can. They have winter plantings. They have summer plantings. The facades on the building are nice. They're with limestone and with marble, with quasi-gargoyles on them. Uh, the bathrooms are meticulously maintained. If you ask any person over the age of 55 that has a prostate issue, uh, they will tell you about, they'll know this gas station very well uh, because they are very well maintained. Uh, and I say that because gas stations sometimes are not well maintained and sometimes they could be considered to be a blight on the community. And that was also part of the reason why Community Board 10 was willing to support this application because of who the operator is. Uh, so that's essentially our application in, in uh, essence. I'd be happy to answer any questions. And Andrew is with Stonefield Engineering, and they did the traffic report and all the traffic consulting on this, and they'd be happy to speak also. Yeah, just a couple of quick questions. Um, so will there be a, a, a turn lane added to North Conduit to control the traffic? Or? No, there'll be no turn lane on, on North Conduit at all. That's, uh, there's no room for a turn lane. But the idea, what I was trying to call out before, right. is that the uh, the side of the North Conduit where that's closest to our property, mm -hmm. that would be on the south side of the North Conduit, is tip, has been right now, if you drive by it during uh, rush hour, you'll okay. see uh, family members and friends picking people up at the subway and stopping on the roadway. So we're hoping by providing a nice uh, spot for them to pull off where they can get a cup of coffee, wouldn't be bad for the operator either, uh, or that we can serve two goals and uh, reduce traffic while at the same time uh, providing service. And will all construction materials be staged on site? Um, yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And I don't know if you mentioned this before, but uh, have you met with the, the BSA uh, to review the proposal? Yes. No, I did not mention that. We have met with the BSA on multiple occasions. There's actually a pending application that's in front of them right now that's scheduled for a public hearing on February 12th. Uh, I believe it's February 12th. I, I may be wrong with my date, and I don't mean to misspeak. I know I just took an oath. I'm going off memory. But it is in the middle of February, and that application was sitting on the sidelines at the BSA until such time that this application was certified. And once this application was certified, the BSA allowed for that application to move ahead with the understanding that it, it cannot move to any potential decision until you act first. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you for your testimony today. Thank you for your time. Uh, are there any other members of the public who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, uh, I now close the public hearing on this application and it will be uh, laid over. Uh, this concludes today's uh, meeting and I would like to thank the members of the public, uh, my colleagues, and of course always the great council uh, and land use staff uh, for their great work. Uh, and with uh, this meeting uh, is now adjourned. <laughs>